Hey, I'm golf broadcaster Matt Adams, the updated and expanded second edition of my book, The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments, is now available. Readers can expect to march with Arnie's Army at the 1960 U.S. Open, relive Jack Nicklaus's remarkable 1986 Masters win, and be amazed by the Tiger Slam. The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments. Pick it up where fine books sold, including barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com. This day in sports history. It's February 15th, and on this day in 1998, Dale Earnhardt finally won the Daytona 500. No other sport puts its biggest event at the start of the season. But for NASCAR, the Daytona 500 is the crown jewel, and for every driver, it is the most coveted win. Dale Earnhardt was known as the intimidator for his driving style, and he didn't mind nudging the fender of the driver in front of him to gain an advantage for a pass on the final lap. You can just ask Terry Labonte about getting his cage rattled at Bristol Motor Speedway in 99. Now, in golf, there is always the talk of the greatest player never to have won a major, and that hangs around a guy's neck like an albatross until he can punch through for a win in one of golf's four major tournaments. Now, applying that same thought to auto racing, Dale Earnhardt, was the greatest driver to have never won the Daytona 500 up until this day. He had tried 19 previous times and had come up short in every one of those attempts. At this point in his career, he had won 74 races and had been the NASCAR champion a record tying seven times. And he had been close at the Daytona 500, finishing second four times. It was also not the track that caused him problems. There are several races held in the lead-up to the 500, like the Clash and the qualification races, and he had won those. There's the race at Daytona over the 4th of July weekend, and he had won that race twice. He won several IROC races on this track, but the Daytona 500 kept slipping away. Mechanical issues, like in 86, when his engine blew when he was leaving the pits while he was leading. Crashes, like in 97, when he was running in the lead pack, before getting tapped by Dale Jarrett, or just plain bad luck, such as the time he hit a seagull back in 91 that damaged his car's aerodynamics enough to spoil the end for him. It always seemed to be something that prevented him from getting to the winner's circle on the biggest stage. Now here in 98, there was Dale Earnhardt's signature black number three Chevrolet out front with 10 laps to go. So much hope, but many wondering What was going to happen this time? Announcer Mike Joy even pointed out that nearly 60% of drivers leading at this point in the race went on to win. Earnhardt had been in this same spot four other times and had yet to take the checkered flag for the win. Now, something to keep in mind that is different now than it was then. Now, if a yellow caution flag comes out, Signaling a wreck or an issue on the track, the field is frozen in place at the time of the yellow flag. And if it's at the end of the race, they'll add laps on at the end to get a green-white checkered flag finish. But here in 98, the rule was different. When the yellow caution flag flew then, there was a race back to the start-finish line. And then the field was frozen in the order cards crossed. And if it was at the end of the race, the final laps would be run under caution, and that would be it. So what was with this finish? On lap 198 of 200, Lake Speed and John Andretti made contact with each other and spun on the backstretch. The yellow flag came out, and the race was on to the start-finish line with Bobby Labonte hot on Earnhardt's tail. Earnhardt swung up the track in turn four to get past lap traffic and then powered home to take the yellow and white flag, signaling the final lap. But since the field was now frozen, passing on the track was not allowed under the yellow. Earnhardt, in essence, took a parade lap to take the checkered flag and win his first and only Daytona 500. And that was special in itself, but what truly made this an amazing experience is that when he drove back around the track and then down pit road towards Victory Lane, every pit crew member of every team was on pit road to greet Earnhardt with a high five because everybody knew how much this win meant to Dale Earnhardt on this day. Interestingly enough, his son Dale Earnhardt Jr. won his first Daytona 500 on this same day in 2004 in only his fifth attempt. Of course, that win was bittersweet, 
since it was just a little shy of three years since Dale Sr. died after hitting the wall on the final lap of the 2001 Daytona 500. Also on this day in 1994, Kentucky pulled off one of the greatest comebacks in NCAA basketball history. Trailing LSU by 31 points with 15 minutes and 30 seconds to play, the Wildcats put together an incredible rally to top the Tigers 99-95. It still stands as the largest second-half deficit ever overcome. And in 2004, Arizona State's baseball team lost 6-0 to Oklahoma, ending a streak of 506 games of scoring at least one run. They had not been shut out in a game in nearly a decade. And that is an NCAA record that is likely to never be broken. Well, that's all I've got for you today. And let me just say, I love putting these together for you. I'm having a blast researching and writing and producing this daily, and I hope you are enjoying listening to it. And if you are, and you have a moment, how about leaving a five-star review and a comment on Apple Podcasts? That would be greatly appreciated. Anyway, thanks for checking out today's episode. I'll see you tomorrow on this day in sports history. Thrive Sweet Productions. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.